2 Corinthians chapter 10, page 1165. Paul's defense of his ministry. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought we make to believe to be obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. You are looking only on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. For even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than pulling you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters. For some say, his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaks, speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with someone who commends themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond our proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the field God has assigned for us, a field that reaches even to you. We are not going too, too far in our boasting, as we would be, uh, as would be the case if we had not come to you. For we do, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of the work done by others. Our hope is that, as your faith continues to grow your area of activity among you will greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about work already done in another man's territory, but let him who boasts in the Lord, for it is not the man who commends himself who is approved, but the man whom the Lord commends. Thank you, Margaret. Let's, let's just pray. For, yes. Lord, we, we just... We ask, Lord, that you open our ears and our minds so that we might hear and understand your word as Margaret brings it to us now. We pray that you would fill Margaret, that your spirit would be in her and that the words that she speaks to us would be words of yours, Lord, the words that you want us to hear. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, when Pope Francis was offered an ermine cope by one of his cardinals, he said, you wear it, the carnival is over. At the time for pomp and flummery is over. The church now has to get on with the business of preaching the gospel and looking after the poor. He's going head to head, confronting ambition and status, complacency and comfort. So he can expect a battle ahead of him. And 2,000 years ago, Paul also fought a battle within the church. I think it's very important for us to remember this battle, this warfare, is something which goes on inside the church. And it's a battle for the hearts and the minds of believers. 
And in this chapter, which is quite convoluted and difficult to understand, I think Paul's declaration of war is in verses 3 to 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, as we've uh, heard and learned over the last few weeks, Corinth was a battle from the start. When Paul went, first of all, with Silas and Timothy and founded the church, he faced a lot of opposition. And he came in fear and trembling, as he says himself. And in Acts 18.9, he tells us that God gave him a vision and said, Don't be afraid, I am with you. I have many people in this city. And he remained 18 months to build up the church. But Corinth was the ultimate messy church. It was completely undisciplined, every man for himself. There were lawsuits and swindling, there was immorality. When people had communion meals, some went hungry and others stuffed themselves. People used spiritual gifts just to show off and not to help one another. There were all sorts of factions and divisions. Oh, I follow Paul. Oh, I follow Peter. I follow Christ. And he had to write lots of letters, as you know, to try and correct their behaviour. Now, in this chapter, the latest thing that Paul takes up is that these new teachers have infiltrated the church and they've turned pe people against Paul. And so the next few chapters, and I think you'll see this even more next week, um, it's a bit like a boxing ring. But we've had hints about this sort of behaviour throughout the whole of 2 Corinthians, and you may remember some of the teaching which Malcolm has brought to us. For example, in chapter 1, people were grumbling because Paul hadn't come when he promised. Well, he's unreliable. He tells them that he, he wanted to give them time because he didn't want to come and make a painful visit because he knew he'd have to confront their bad behaviour. And then, of course, he's got all the other churches to look after as well. And then there were lots of snide remarks because he didn't charge for his teaching. So it can't be worth much. They were valuing themselves by how much they, they got. And in the book of Acts, it tells us that when Paul first went to Corinth, he worked as a tent maker with Aquila and Priscilla. And later on, some of the other churches supported him. And he says later in chapter 11, when he comes again, he's not going to be a burden on them. That's not how he works. The gospel is free. In 11 verse 7, he says, Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God free of charge? But here in chapter 10, he really takes the gloves off. What they say about him? Oh, he's two-faced. He's timid when he's, uh, when he's with us, but when, when he's away from us, he's really bold and weighty in his letters. But he comes, as he says, he, he entreats them with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He doesn't want to come with a great big cudgel. In verse 2, he hopes he doesn't have to need to be bold when he comes, because he's hoping that they will repent and improve their behaviour. But he's ready, in verse 8, he'll be ready to punish every act of disobedience, fighting talk. Verse 10 Oh, sorry, in chapter 10, the, uh, these people were saying his letters are weighty and forceful. In person, he's unimpressive, and his speaking amounts to nothing. They didn't like his style of speaking because, of course, they were used to the, sort of, the Roman style, the Greek style, where people use oratory and rhetoric. You know, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the fields, we will never surrender. Yeah. But, he, wasn't, he was a plain speaking man. He knew that you can use tricks and techniques to persuade people one way or another. He wanted them to be convinced by the blood of Christ and that alone. When I came to you, brothers, he says, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I was resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. These people also accused Paul of assuming too much authority. 
and even poked in on their territory. It was a bit of a cheat, considering he founded the church in the first place. But he had a different attitude. I planted Apollos, who was a fellow worker. Apollos watered. God gave the increase. And he says plainly, we do not want to boast about work already done in another man's territory. So you can see these two sides of exchanging these punches. But, but why? The question for us is why does Paul get into this fight? Is he worried about his reputation? Is he feeling a bit peeved because he did all the hard work and then these other people are kind of taking over? I think the clue, though, is in verse 7. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is in Christ, so also are we. Because some of these teachers were saying, oh, we follow Christ. And they were making it as, you know, aren't they great? So now this is where I think the heart of this chapter is. We follow Christ, they say, and really, says Paul, you were only looking on the surface of things. And I think this sort of reminded me when you were looking at, what's he trying to get at here? What's, what's the point of all of this argy-bargy? And it reminded me of that famous scene in Shakespeare's Hamlet. So we're just going to nip away from Corinth and go to Denmark for a few minutes. Uh, you might remember the story where um, Hamlet, who was a king, his father died. And his mother marries Hamlet's uncle and the uncle becomes king instead of Hamlet. Then Hamlet's father appears to him as a ghost. And he tells Hamlet he was murdered by the uncle. So Hamlet confronts his mother. They're both are wearing lockets. He's got one of his dad and she's got one of her new husband. So I can't do the Shakespearean bit, but I'll just go out a little bit. And what Hamlet they said, look... Look here, upon this picture and on this, see what a grace was seated on this brow. And then he described the good, the noble king that his father was. This was your husband. Look you now what follows. Here is your husband. Like a mildewed ear, blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and batten on this moor. Because this new king, the uncle, he was a usurper. He was consumed with lust and greed. He was a murderer. So Hamlet is comparing the two. Why? Because he's forcing his mother to face the truth and show what a bad choice she's made. And I think in this kind of body of Paul's, he's trying to do the same thing. He's trying to force the Corinthians to make a choice. But the choice is not between Paul and Paul's critics. It's really between those who claim to choose Christ and those who really do. And so he aims to blow apart all these pretensions that have set themselves against the knowledge of God. And this is at the heart of Spiritual warfare, which you probably saw on the sheet, is a kind of theme for today. But it's a different kind of warfare. It's not what we normally think of. We normally think of fighting the world and the flesh and the devil. But this is about something within. And I think chapter 10 exposes what's really going on in people's hearts. Jesus says, we know a tree by its fruit. And we too need to weigh up the evidence so we shouldn't follow charisma and fame and eloquence. We should follow character. And so if you're going to choose between two leaders, which is what Paul is trying to get at, you don't go for the one with all this fancy talk and the rhetoric and the style. But you look, what kind of person is this? What kind of character have they actually got? Are they really belonging to Christ. If they belong to Christ, they will begin to look like Christ. So here, in this chapter, we can bring out some of the details which will help us as well. Let's look at these people who have been criticising Paul. What are they like? Well, obviously they're very critical. 
They're out to undermine. They're encouraging rivalry between the believers. I think 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, Jealousy and strife and divisions show that they are of flesh, not spirit. As we've mentioned, these people preferred lofty language. They used all these fancy techniques to influence the crowd and attract followers to themselves and admirers. They liked the charismatic speaker, looked down on plain guys like Paul. And they were always comparing themselves with other people. And of course, they were superior when they came out of that comparison. And Paul says, you're just without understanding. You're just not wise. They boasted of their own gifts. They were jealous of Paul. And of course, they charged for their services because, as everyone knows, however, however much money you get, that shows how worthwhile you are, doesn't it? Then we look at Paul. What was his character? Well, he showed the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He came as a servant and he wasn't a burden on them. He talks about the Father's heart. He labored for 18 months with these people and his care and anxiety didn't stop when he went off to Thessaloniki or somewhere. He continues to write and send Timothy and send others, Titus, to help them out. And, of course, he was a suffering servant. And there's references in chapters 1, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 11, speaking about all kinds of sufferings and hardships. In chapter 1, he talks about being burdened beyond strength. In 7, and, uh, verse 5, fighting without and fear within. He was also a tender-hearted man, and he speaks with great affection about his fellow workers. And at one time, he was so worried about Titus that he, he left his work and went to Macedonia to search for him because he was worried about him. He was concerned for the poor and got that collection up, as you remember the last uh, uh, sermon which Malcolm gave us. He did write strong words to the Corinthians, but he didn't enjoy it. And in chapter 2, he talks about, he wrote to them in tears, with anxiety and distress. And he didn't collect personal followers. They were beloved children. And, and lastly, he relied on God's power, not the power of his words. So does this sort of begin to remind you of somebody else, <laughs> these qualities? Who wins the battle of character? Who shows more of the character of Christ? And those are the trustworthy leaders, but also... Those are the trustworthy followers. This is where I think we will come in. So why does it matter? Is this just an interesting bit of history? Well, I think it does matter. And I think it is to do with a, a spiritual battle that we all must face. Because if we don't win this spiritual battle, we won't win any other. If we pick up that verse again about Paul saying he's against all his pretensions. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We can't take on the world, the flesh or the devil until we ourselves are obedient to Christ until we've taken captive every thought within our own hearts and minds. So really, spiritual warfare is about a battle of obedience. And to equip ourselves for it, we've got to take prisoners. We take captive every thought. And behind all these spiritual battles is really just one single principle. Is it Christ first? Or is it me first? And I think if you think of the world, the flesh and the devil, that same principle is, is really what's at the back of it. Is it Christ first or me first? But if we're not focused, we're going to be like these people in the boxing ring um, who let our minds drift. You know, so you imagine you've got your gloves on and, and then you're going, oh, I'm not really... Focused. And then suddenly you're going, to get, you're going to end up on the floor, aren't you? You're going to get, find yourself being counted out. And I think it's the same for us. We've got to be always aware that we need to be focused. 
Of course we need to know where the enemy is, but more than anything else, we need to focus on Christ. And then we're not going to end up flat on our back. But there's a lot in here as well that we can use as a checklist for our own behaviour. Do we compare ourselves with others? Or do we let Christ be our standard of behaviour? Do we want to be commended by men or by God? Are we easily impressed by charismatic speakers and how it would show? And do we go chasing around after the latest fashionable speaker? Do we rely on words of eloquent wisdom rather than the power of Christ? Do we show off our gifts and talents and feel superior to others? Or do we consider ourselves to be servants and stewards of the mysteries of God? Do we boast about men or do we boast about Christ? And are we taking new ground for the gospel? So in all of these things we can think, hmm, you know, which, where am I in all of this battle? It's so easy to be sit on the outskirts as it were and then think oh that's them but I think you know we let this examine ourselves and say well where you know am I up to scratch in this battle I think spiritual warfare is not quite what we think I think in there was a tradition at one time where people would you know shout bible verses at the devil or walk around towns and and shout and things like this. And I thought, this is not what it's about. It always has to be about Christ and him. He's the first. He's the last. He's our focus. And if we obey him, he's going to sort out the enemies. What we need to do is focus on him and take new ground for the gospel. And I think that is the fight that we've been called to. There is power there, but it's not power as the world sees it. It's the power of the cross. And it's the power of ourselves being captive, but captive to Christ. So what's the church's secret weapon? I think it's described beautifully in chapter 5, verse 9. We make it our aim to please him. It's very simple. We make it our aim to please him. So if we summarise what Paul's getting at in chapter 10, I think we could say, let's get things the right way round. Our first call is not to resist the temptation of the flesh, or take on the world, or challenge the devil. We can only fight them successfully when we do these three things. Secure in our own heart and mind, in obedience to Christ. Encouraging the church to greater obedience and love for him. And then standing together as we take more and more ground for the Lord by witnessing to his goodness and extending his kingdom. In chapter 10, I think Paul is saying that the carnival of personal ambition and self-service is over. But the carnival can also be a time of joy and celebration. And I think there's a lot that we can learn here in this church as we approach Malcolm's sabbatical. We could say, well, let our theme be, let's make it our aim to please Christ. Malcolm, like Paul, is is going to go away, but we don't want to be receiving strong letters from him. You know, we we want him to come back and rejoice because the kingdom's been extended and we've grown in the depth of discipleship. So I think what we could do is we need to pray for one another. And we could pray for these things in particular. Pray for the deacons that we'll be faithful stewards and we'll be diligent in serving Christ and the flock and that we'll guard the truths of the scriptures. But together, because many of you I know are mature in the Lord, you know your Bibles, uh, you too would pray that together we'll make sure that we guard the, these precious truths and not allow any teaching that deviates from the, the cross. We can also help one another to promote the unity of the body. And uh, you know, Nigel mentioned earlier that he felt there was a harmony here, but we have to preserve that. Let's honour and serve one another. 
and be forbearing with each other's faults and weaknesses. And certainly during the sabbatical, I'm sure that you'll be very much aware of the weaknesses of the deacons and so on, but we will ask for your forbearance. Not that you just let things ride. You may need to correct us or bring something to our attention, which is fine. But we will need that grace amongst us. We also need to encourage each other's gifts. Not like these people so they could show off, but that we can minister to one another. And, you know, we'd encourage you not to be afraid to offer a kind of some service, however humble, and don't let shyness or a feeling of inadequacy stand in your way. Because Paul's saying here, you don't need words of eloquent wisdom. You don't have to worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words that you need at the right time. He will always give us the grace to bless another. I think also, again, taking the example from Paul, we can spur one another on to support those who are suffering. We can speak encouragingly to one another. And we can continue to support the poor. And Penny sent out an email asking people who'd went on the caring and listening course if there were things that they could offer. Well... Please, you know, do offer, even a small thing. I think this is a wonderful opportunity the Lord's given us while Malcolm's away for us to grow, grow close to one another, to grow in our service as well. And I'm sure as in verse 15 in chapter 10, Malcolm would probably echo this. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our area of activity among you will greatly expand. So we want to continue to promote the gospel while he's away, whether we're old or young. We want to see more baptisms here. Let's see how many baptisms we can have before Malcolm returns. (laughs) (coughs) But how can we do this? How can we truly love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength? and our neighbour as ourselves. Am I just saying, oh, here's a to-do list, just get on with it? Well, no. I just want to take a slight detour. Um, Last week, uh, I blew up my toaster with a hot cross bun. (laughs) I think it was a sultana which got into the element, and then poof, it had gone. And I was telling my colleagues at work about this, And then one guy said, ah, it's the power of the cross. (laughs) (laughs) And I I thought that's amusing, but there's a truth there. And I thought, we can't do all of these things in our own strength. We, We haven't got the ability, and that's partly what Paul is trying to say. We're not relying on man. We're not leaning on man's gifts. Uh, We have to rely totally on the Holy Spirit and on Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 4, he says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And of course, this power is a gift. It's a gift from God, isn't it? And in Corinthians 1 verses 2 to 3, he says, I behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God. And that's what we'll be relying on and always need to rely on. It's God's grace through Jesus that's available in abundance every day for us. And therefore, let us boast about him. We're not going to boast about man and what we can achieve. Let's boast of him and bring glory to his name, not just now, not just during the sabbatical, but until he comes again. Amen. Amen. Let's just have a, a moment of quietness and just reflect, and then I'll finish with a prayer. Lord, we are in a a spiritual war, but the battle that Paul teaches here is a battle of obedience. Lord, as we obey you, we will trust you, Lord, to fight. 
your other enemies in the world and all those who rear themselves against you. But for ourselves, Lord, we just rejoice in these truths. Even if the battle is hard as it was for Paul, we rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe, strong in thy strength, safe in thy keeping, tender. We rest on thee and in thy name we go. We go in faith, our own great weakness feeling and needing more each day thy grace to know. Yet from our hearts a song of triumph pealing, we rest on thee and in thy name we go. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. Thine is the battle, thine shall be the praise. When passing through the gates of pearly splendor, victors, we rest with thee through endless days. Amen.